right. Welcome, everyone, to the People and the Planet Lightning Talk session now. My name is Yvonne. Maybe you saw me in the, in the opening uh, session this morning. I'm very excited for this session and to hear from you. Um, we have today actually eight speakers. We're supposed to have two, uh, ten, but two cancelled, unfortunately, had to cancel. But we have eight uh, talks featuring topics around humanitarian relief, equity, inclusion and social impact related to climate and environment. Um, we have very strict rules in the session. We have uh, five minutes per speaker. Um, after four minutes... My colleague here, Brian, will hold up a speaker uh, to the speaker of one minute. <laughs> then you have one minute left. And then after five minutes, we're going to show to the audience applause, and that will stop your talk. <laughs> uh, so everyone is encouraged to participate then. Um, however, because we have only eight speakers, we have uh, time for Q&A at the end. So keep your questions for them. And if you want to add something to your talk, then... All right, with that, this is our speakers list today. The one in italic, Michelle and Jordi had to cancel, but the rest is here and we're looking forward. Um, yeah, the rest I said already. With that, let's kick it off. Our first speaker is Nikki Tully. Um, Tully is an assistant research scientist at the Barney NASA Ames Research Center and a PhD candidate at the University of Arizona. Nikki herself is a member of the Navajo Nation, an indigenous nation located in the United uh, States Southwest, and as a member of the NASA Indigenous People Initiatives, Initiative, she works to foster ethical and culturally relevant space for the use of Earth observations in the indigenous communities. And with that, the floor is yours. Yat e she e niki tuli in a she tone jitni na shla. Besto glidin de skis dent na sha. Akwit ego de nen san shle. Di big echo di yin na hoka. De nen niki dot ni. Da de nen ni glin go nasko at a hol ato. So what I shared with you is, is my name and telling you where I'm from. I feel that if we're talking about community and this is a community event, I felt that it's only right to speak the language of the community of which this event is um, looking at. And that goes to show um, what I'm showing you here, um, displayed on the screen, is the logo for the event that we had. The logo was called the Nehama the art of uh, the Art of Mother Earth. And in this, it's acknowledging the community and people and the land and the relationship. And what I shared with you in, in my language of, of uh, identifying myself, but also recognizing of what we call ourselves, which is the, the holy earth surface people, and that we will always remain ourselves, uh, remain calling ourselves in that way. And so how did this all begin? And where did this all start? Why did this logo, why was this logo for an earth observation developed in this way? Well, we're a matrilineal society and we recognize that the earth is our mother and in that way we recognize that the, um, the, uh, the beings and the living of not just what we observe but the, the reality of the life that is within that. And so in this logo that we developed for this event, that's what we really try to transpire to, to show and build this trust and community relationship. But where did that all start from? This is my grandmother, and she was the very first one to teach me about what this means. My earth observation journey did not begin with a keyboard. It started with the verbal stories of songs and prayers and, and the stories themselves of walking the landscapes. And so she lived to be about 100 years old. And so it was that century old knowledge that came forward of, of teaching me about those earth observations before Western science had the chance to. And so I, why I share this with you is to show you that those teaching remains just like data might remain in some server somewhere the the, the knowledge remains in, in our head as well and in our community in this aspect of passing on knowledge. And so that's what comes into this understanding. If you're interested in working with an indigenous community and interested in, in going into a community not like yours, but bringing in what might be considered new knowledge or technology, you have to understand that the change that has occurred, but also the resiliency that remains. And so I share these images with you, starting from the far, um, if you're looking this way, the far left to the far right of our, our creation stories, but recognizing the detrimental impacts that first contact had with 
with the, the US federal government and the changes that came thereafter um, that you see there with that change of that individual, of that young man, of, of the traditional aspect to where the Western influence came in. Which brings you now to this present day of, of who we are as we recognize ourselves of the Navajo with this um, Navajo Nation flag represented there. And this uh, lightning talk of people and planet, I'm really hitting heavy on the, the people component because we can oftentimes develop these really awesome tools and these really awesome data sets, but who are the people that we're interested in impacting with the tools and data that we're interested in? And so I wanted to give you a little brief insight to what the Navajo Nation looks like. The Navajo Nation is located in the south um, west of the United States in the states of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah and covers over 71,000 square, uh, square kilometers. And the largest Native American reservation. But there is also this long legacy of people living in this area. We as the Navajo who um, have lived in this area for thousands of years and in, in our stories where we believe that we have always lived and where we uh, were created. Approximately there's 400,000 members in the Navajo Nation. But the as you can tell, 400,000 people, those living on the reservation and off the reservation, how can we summarize what those um, interests are of how Earth observations can be applicable? So we went into this um, concept of understanding what is the community value? How can we support that? And this is where uh, the app was developed, Nikamana Hassan, to help us understand um, and how we could bring Earth observation in the area of um, a tool powered by Google Earth Engine. I want to give a shout out to Justin Broughton, who really helped us convey this message in, in developing these Landsat composite images. And so the, the next step was, how are we going to get the people here? And that was by looking at the community relevance of how do we bring community together? And that was through family, food, and fun. And so recognizing that there's this transgenerational effort of passing on stories like I shared early on. So how do we create this valuing of all community members? And this was an event that was highly focused on the family structure of bringing these earth observations to people. And so that led us to the second day of this event of what is the community saying and how do these small acts turn into big acts and building trust through the efforts made through understanding the community work being done. And if you want to hear about part two, come to Indigenizing Maps to tomorrow. Thank you. This was a great start. Our second speaker is Becky Siegel, who works for the Arctic Eider Society, coordinating the maps for their platform called SIKU, the Indigenous Knowledge Social Network. People across the Arctic are using SIKU to share their environmental and indigenous knowledge and monitor the environment. Becky's work focuses on mapping map services available for indigenous people using the land, for example, sharing satellite data, creating a custom, customized ice map, and detecting dangerous ice hazards with machine learning. Looking forward to your more. Thanks. I am here today to talk about SIKU, which is an indigenous-driven platform created by the Arctic Eider Society. The Arctic Eider Society is based in Sanakilak, Nunavut, and through SIKU, we work with indigenous communities across the Canadian and international north to facilitate indigenous self-determination in research, education, and environmental stewardship. Siku is available as iOS and Android apps and as a web platform, and it is a tool that combines many tools into one place. Siku is also free to use, and it's built to support indigenous harvesters and travelers, as well as indigenous-driven environmental monitoring projects. The image at the center of the screen here shows what the home page of the Siku app looks like, and so it displays a summary of your trips, observations, harvests, and more. And Siku is now being used by more than 20,000 people. The Hikute project on the right shows a subset of the wide variety of posts made in just a six month period. Our annual ice watch also shows what Siku can achieve across communities and throughout the ice 
season, Siku users make ice posts when they're out traveling and upload their observations when they get back to town. The Ice Watch helps facilitate ice safety, language, and knowledge transfer. So how does Earth Engine fit in? Siku provides map services for harvesters and travelers. Earth Engine powers the satellite map layers available on Siku, making satellite data more accessible to people in the north than ever before. Sentinel-2, served with Earth Engine optimized visualizations, is one of our most popular map layers. We recently began bringing other satellite data sets into our operational pipelines. And shown here is our new radar map layer, which combines Sentinel-1 imagery with RadarSat Constellation mission imagery provided by the Canadian Space Agency. We're also working to bring, uh, or we are bringing in near real-time MODIS data into Siku through NASA's MODIS LANs. And our satellite map layers provide Siku users with critical information about travel conditions, including potentially dangerous ice conditions. Earth Engine also helps us create the Siku ice map, which provides up-to-date information on sea ice conditions. It shows ice types and locations, highlighting differences between stationary ice that's used for travel from mobile ice that moves and is less good for travel, as well as thinner and growing ice from thicker ice. It's created by combining on the ground ice posts made by Siku users with vector ice charts and radar data. Ice posts are the best way for Siku users to share knowledge about small dangerous features. Sea ice types can be tagged in local dialects using a highly specialized indigenous ice classification system to help share knowledge about language and ice. And this is important because the ice map is missing small but important hazards within the stationary land fast ice, like this open water pollinia shown on the left um, that's too small for governments to put in their ice charts. So our team is working to identify these areas using radar imagery and machine learning so that they can be added to our ice map. And ice posts made by Siku users will help us towards this and future machine learning efforts. So with that, I want to say Thank you to the many people across the North who have contributed to Siku's success. And also a big thank you to the Google team and all of our sponsors and partners for their support. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Our third speaker is Rona Cox, a professor in geosciences at Williams College, Massachusetts. She researches wave impacts on rocky coasts, mega gravel transport, and distinguishing extreme storm from tsunami deposits. She also studies how land loss affects indigenous community in coastal Louisiana. Rona is a fellow of the Geological Society of America and an elected member of the Royal Irish Academy and recipient of the Geological Society of America's Distinguished Service Award. She is also an honorary member of the, of the Indigenous People of Louisiana tribe. And... Exactly. <laughs> Great. So with that, you have five minutes. Thanks. Uh, oops, let me just set my timer. And he has the one minute. Okay. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, I do this work in collaboration with uh, Chief Devon Parfait, a former student of mine, and also Elder Chief Sherelle Parfait Dardar. And these are two extraordinarily badass people, lions for their tribe and for Southern Louisiana environmental justice. Uh, in particular, and uh, Sherelle um, has been a 2023 USA Today Woman of the Year for Louisiana and very well deserved. So much of Louisiana is very close to sea level. 
All of these blue colours here uh, near the coast are within a couple of metres of. And if we um, zoom in here to this area, uh, you can see how much of the land is very, very low lying indeed. In, 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 with some areas that are nominally inland uh, being below sea level. And the homelands of the Grand Dulac people uh, are within this box. And you can, uh, you can see how this is a particularly low lying area. Um, and so uh, we know that land is being lost very rapidly in southern Louisiana. So I'm going to flick back and forth uh, between these two cases here, 1960 and today, where today is a few years ago. Uh, and here, for reference, is the Grand Caillou Dulac Band. So you can see that there's been a lot of land loss in their particular area. And uh, with the marvelous assistance of Sam Roy, uh, we use Google Earth Engine to do some initial characterizations. By we, I actually mean Devon. <laughs> I learned how to do this stuff yesterday. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we showed that, the, the, that it, um, in the 80s, 75% of their area was land. It was only 56% only of it was still land uh, in 2019. This is a land loss rate of 0.8% per year, uh, which if you remember the map, it's the uh, regional average for coastal Louisiana is 0.3. So this is triple the land loss rate, um, and it's obviously an environmental injustice issue. So these native communities, they're right there in, in the face of the oncoming storms uh, and uh, increased flooding risks. And because they've been societally marginalized for decades and centuries uh, with reduced schooling, the, the average um, household income in Dulac is $7,000 a year. Uh, these people do not have a lot of resilience. And so because they are not recognized federally as a tribe, they cannot speak to FEMA. They are reliant on state resources pr uh, primarily, um, and they, uh, they are often like, you know, bottom of the list in terms of, of aid. And this was particularly true after Hurricane Ida a couple of years ago. And this is a very grainy picture, but this is Sherelle and Devon out um, protesting and raising awareness. So they are petitioning or they're preparing to petition for federal recognition. And there's a lot of criteria they have to meet. And a very important one is the one in bold, that a substantial portion of the group inhabits a specific area or lives in a community viewed as American Indian and has done for at least the 20th century, right? And so the problem is that the members of the tribe are scattered across several communities within this southern Louisiana area. And we've shown, and this is the point of this talk, um, although I've got a minute and 36 seconds left, uh, that tribal ancestors migrated away from lands historically because of land loss. A lot of the homeland right now looks like this, um, but in the 20th century, it was mostly land. So this is a USGS benchmark that in 1932 was right next to somebody's house. Okay, And this is all now underwater, and that oak is dead, as are these oaks that have been inundated by marshland. So this land loss means loss, loss, loss of your ability to create a livelihood. You can't grow a, plant, grow a vegetable. You can't graze a cow. Uh, so you're going to leave, right? And the challenge is to find a way to convince um, the Bureau of Indian uh, Affairs that, 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 that this is valid. So we use the tribal genealogies in conjunction with historical records from the Bureau of Land Management to identify land holdings of tribal ancestors. This is the same as the past, but it's now in more legible script. And we then find the very precise locations of these areas and find the original maps of those areas. This is the township range and section of that previous document. And then we find the lat long coordinates and we plot them. Uh, so this is section 34, which belonged to a tribal ancestor. This is what it looks like now. This is what it looked like in the 19th century. Okay, so we can bring in these 19th century maps where you can see that this was solid land at the time. Now it's largely open water. This is why these people have left. We believe that these data, which we are also putting into, this is a work in progress, into Google Maps, uh, will be useful to the tribe and uh, will help support their petition to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rona. Yeah, thanks. With that, our fourth speaker is Jamin Van Den Hoek. No, Van Den Hoek, right? <laughs> 
who is an associate professor at the, uh, of geography at the Oregon State University, where he leads the Conflict Ecology Lab and works at the intersection of humanitarian and conflict research, land cover, land use change, and geospatial science. He uses satellite imagery and a variety of geospatial data sets to monitor damage to cities and landscapes caused by armed conflict and uh, develop new approaches to map refugee movements and refugee environmental relationships and monitor long-term environmental and climate change in politically fragile context around the world. Happy to hear more from you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for the, the talks to lead uh, that led into this. Um, I guess by way of a, a introduction, there are about 25, uh, 35 million refugees across uh, 137 of the world's 195 countries who have been displaced by violence or persecution. Uh, each year this number grows, especially with recent conflicts in Ukraine um, and Sudan. This is a map based on UNHCR data showing the distribution. It's not every country, but it's a global phenomenon. Now, refugees and internally displaced persons, IDPs, um, as well as others living in informal settlements uh, like slums or favelas, they're broadly excluded from a lot of the policy frameworks like Sustainable Development Goals, Sendai Disaster Risk Reduction Platform, and other climate risk impact assessments that communities living in more formal um, uh, organized settlements, especially big cities in the global north, uh, benefit from. So the forced displacement and subsequent settlement of refugees and IDPs affects individuals, families, and entire communities around the world. That's a given. But those processes are often rapid and data scarce. However, they yield patterns in built up and natural landscapes that can be long lasting, information rich, and uh, to the point of today's presentation, detectable from space. So we see here on the right hand side, this is Pajrina refugee settlement in northern Uganda, and you can see just about now the beginning, this explosion of infrastructure, new dwellings, land clearing, as um, broadly uh, Sudanese and South Sudanese refugees settled in mid-2016. Here it is again. This is a, obviously a time loop. So in our work at, uh, in the Conflict Ecology Lab at Oregon State University, we tried to take these processes that are often very localized, very acute, um, and done through a particular kind of humanitarian lens, and we try to expand those over space, over time, through multi-site analysis, long-term analysis, and through different themes that are traditionally not done with refugees and IDPs. And we do this uh, global scale. Um, I want to share three examples very quickly of how we've done this. Um, the first work uh, we did in this, uh, in this uh, kind of uh, problem space was uh, mapping the expansion of that settlement that we were just looking at, however, not through a visual interpretation of satellite imagery, but rather through us, uh, Landsat and Sentinel-2 time series. Uh, we used a disturbance detection algorithm called BFAST to map uh, the specific date per pixel of where the land was cleared to make way for this refugee settlement. We also tracked, you can see on the right-hand side in 2017, most of that change there is farming. This happens to be a scenario or a, a setting where refugees actually have access to land to cultivate crops. We were able then to chart this arc of establishment and land use led by refugees in this setting um, and found good agreement with official UN agency statistics. And retrospectively, we were able to show that these data were actually, had we been doing this in real time, which we were not, we would have had information on this a full two years ahead of other open data collected from OpenStreetMap, for example. We're also using Earth Engine to automatically detect IDP settlements and estimate IDP populations even when humanitarian access is blocked in places like Tigray in northern Ethiopia. Um, because humanitarian access was blocked, uh, opportunities for detecting individual IDP sites was, com was severely curtailed. Um, broad uncertainty about the population and, and site-specific conditions. Now we Using some historically known IDP sites, we were able to train um, a detection algorithm, in this case using a different kind of approach. This is using CCDC, for those who are familiar with that. Sentinel-2 data, as well as the harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 time series. Train this on 400 sites established since 2015, 
and map this across Tigray. And we don't have our final numbers yet, so I didn't want to share those, but we're seeing lots and lots of IDP sites that have thus far been unmapped. We've also looked at climate risk impact assessments um, across East Africa. Here we used Google Earth Engine to build a novel climate and environmental exposure index. We looked at 11 different Earth observation products available in the uh, Earth Engine catalog associated with flooding, drought, extreme heat, landslides. Built a composite index, which we can see here on the right-hand side, where uh, dark green is less exposure, brown is higher exposure. And we see that most camps fall right in the middle of this distribution. This is not a, basically a doom and gloom scenario. We see actually lots of camps moderately exposed. Thanks so much for your attention. If you're interested in uh, this work, we have a couple of links there. And if you want to work on this with us at Oregon State, please get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Jamin. With that, our fifth speaker is Robin Al-Haddad, Al uh, who is an independent consultant at DEVRA International. She holds a Master at, uh, of Legal Studies specializing in international human rights law and a Master of Development Practice from the University of Arizona. Robin has over 14 years of combined experience working in the field of refugee uh, resettlement human rights, food security, gender equality, and education. And as a 2019 National Geographic Explorer awardee, Robin served as a project leader for a project that aims to document a Rohingya refugee youth's perspective on their migration experience. She is also a lead author of a manuscript documenting the process of participatory geospatial mapping with her Hinja refugees to collect their spatial narratives and migration stories. With that, looking forward to hear more. Thank okay, thank you. Okay. So, Their World Project is a National Geographic Society funded project, and as we mentioned, it's aimed to um, document Rohingya refugee youth's perspective on their migration experience. Um, so we are working with the Rohingya in refugee camps in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. And just as a reminder for people who may not know, the Rohingya are an ethnic stateless a minority group who are from Myanmar and who have been subjected to long-standing geographical injustices and, and suffered many human rights violations. Um, and they left, they fled Myanmar in 2017 and have gone into neighboring country of Bangladesh and are currently in refugee camps in Bangladesh. So we aim to record their stories and empower them to document their own stories. Um, so we have a team of researchers from the Human Rights Practice Program at the University of Arizona, and we're also working with a community-based NGO called Artolution, and we collaborate with the Center for Peace Studies in, uh, for, with North-South University in Dhaka. Um, so during participatory mapping exercises, we work with Rohingya teaching artists who work with Artolution um, to help us interview Rohingya youth and collect their migration stories. And we did some hands-on um, learning sessions in refugee camps um, using Google Earth Pro in July of 2022. So we can also conduct some uh, draw and tell exercises where we kind of geolocate those drawings onto the map and we get responses about their drawings and we use those to annotate our map and help visualize their stories. Um, so as you might think, we are working in a refugee camp, so there are a lot of challenges. Um, so we are working obviously in a remote area, so we have limited cell cellular network, limited internet connectivity. Um, so we choose to use Google Earth Pro. It's a desktop application, and the reason we use it is because um, you can actually use it offline. Um, you can, as long as you cache the data ahead of time, you can use it offline. Additionally, Google Earth Pro has the ability to do historical imagery, and um, Google Earth Web doesn't have this ability. So it's particularly important to have this historical imagery for the Rohingya in their context because uh, the Myanmar government had burned down many of their villages, and so the landscape today does not look the same as it did in 2017 when they fled. Um, and then finally, we later transfer the data over to Google Earth 
uh, web, once we have you know reliable internet and we want to create public awareness on refugee and migration issues. Um, other challenges we have are um, locating specific villages, and that is due to a couple of different reasons. Um, some, to some extent, it's, it's, it has to do with the inconsistencies in spelling of place names, but also the issue is um, the common place names that are used by the Rohingya are quite different than the official names given to the area by the Myanmar gov government. And so that makes ensuring geographical locations, you know, a little, the accuracy a little bit difficult. Um, so it's important to note that the Myanmar government actually removed many of the Rohingya's village names from their official maps. Um, so they've either removed the names altogether or they were reclassified by the government. And this happened in 2020. So this obviously impacts Google Maps as well. Um, and one marker, one important marker of representation is through the language of place names. Um, we know that, you know, label uh, name place names are not just labels on a map that many linguistic minority groups um, their identity is really interwoven and co-shaped by their place um, and so our results from our project have indicated that participatory mapping exercises can help to lend agency to those who have suffered from geographical injustices and it helps them process their trauma, it helps them validate their lived experiences, it empowers marginalized voices and helps provide insights to policymakers. And map, the map making process itself can ha provide an opportunity for people to reclaim their representation, their geographical representation, um, and also propose alternatives to the dominant discourses that we see in official maps. Um, and, uh, lastly, a uh, narrative-based geovisualization geo also provides greater insights to policymakers as we connecting story to place. Um, it, it allows to have that critical contextualization of a person's story that makes it um, more understandable and help inspire change. <clears throat> And finally, I just wanted to leave everybody with this quote. Um, this is from a man named Bashar Ula, and he is a Rohingya refugee artist. Um, and as many of us like to do, the first time you get onto Google Earth, you want to find your home. And he was the first person in our group to find his home on the map. Um, and just rem as a reminder, the Re Rohingya at the time had not seen their home in the last five years. So he said, from the very beginning, the Myanmar government removed our names from the past. And since 1942, we were not allowed to do many things. We were not allowed to, um, when we came here to Bangladesh, we learned how to draw and how to use pencils and how to um, use colors. And now we're learning how to draw our own maps. The military tried to remove our names, but now we are making our own maps so that people will know our names. And I am very happy the Myanmar government is not able to re remove our names from the history because we are learning how to make some ma maps right now. And when I see my home here, I'm crying on the inside because it's like being home again. So come find me. Thank you. Come find me after the talks if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Our sixth speaker is Ali Ballinger, who is a lecturer in geocomputation at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis at the University College London. He completed his PhD at Oxford University uh, university's Department for International Development, where his thesis assessed the impact of an agricultural development program on insurgent recruitment in Turkey. He's also a tech fellow for Bellingcat, where he works on articles, educational material, and tools that utilize machine learning, satellite imagery, and other public data sets to conduct open source investigations in conflict settings on issues ranging from including oil pollution detection to civil harm. With that, the floor is yours. Thanks. All right. Um, this is my first like non-academic talk, so I apologize in advance. Um, it might be pretty dry. We're actually going to skip the abstract part and just talk about why um, I decided to try to develop a new damage detection algorithm. Um, basically, the initial task that I wanted to do 
was to assess damage uh, in all of Ukraine. Um, the issue with that, as compared to traditional damage assessment tasks, is that uh, with the state-of-the-art methods that we have for damage detection, you have high-resolution optical imagery over a very small area, you train a neural network to identify damage, and then you run it. Um, there are a couple problems with this when you're looking at an entire country. The first is that damage is ongoing, right? So you need not only a pre and post image, you need many post images. If you're buying high res imagery, that gets expensive really quickly. Um, a lot of neural networks have a really hard time generalizing to new geographies and have to be retrained. That kind of defeats the purpose if your aim is to uh, you know, have one thing that works well kind of everywhere. Um, and clouds, obviously big problem for everyone using optical imagery. Um, so a lot, a lot of issues when we're trying to do damage detection um, multi-temporally, like frequently and over a large area. So one of the solutions uh, is to use synthetic aperture radar SAR imagery. Uh, have people encountered or used SAR imagery before? Oh, fantastic. Uh, so I can skip a lot of the basic stuff, right? A lot of um, advantages, penetrates clouds, uh, very good for detecting things like damaged buildings because they look really different in terms of their amplitude. So there are already ways of doing damage detection using synthetic aperture radar imagery. One of those is, uh, the main one is interferometry where you look at uh, the change in the coherence of a signal. Uh, the issue is that in Earth Engine, we do not have single look complex data. We only have the amplitude data. Um, and if I wanted to do coherence uh, damage detection over the entirety of Ukraine, I would have to download all of the source images and run the computation locally. That again, kind of defeats the purpose uh, of trying to do damage detection for an entire country. So I decided to try to make a poor man's interferometry using Google Earth Engine by applying what is basically just a t-test to the backscatter, the amplitude uh, data that we get back from Sentinel-1. And we can fake um, a coherence by kind of isolating the right type of imagery and running um, basically an apples to apples comparison. So the first step is to disaggregate the imagery based on orbital pass, right? We wanna compare ascending to ascending and descending to descending. Um, we separate by polarization within that. So we wanna compare VV to VV, um, VH to VH. And then we need to split our data into a pre and post event time period. Uh, and then it's just the t-test, right? So we calculate the mean of the, um, uh, at each sort of, um, you know, within each one of those separations that I defined earlier. Uh, we calculate the standard deviation. Then you just run a t-test on each unique combination of those three uh, factors. And then just an absolute value average of the t-values that result from that test. So you're literally comparing the uh, pre-event mean of the reflectance to the post-event mean of the reflectance and uh, scaling that by the standard deviation and you just get t-values. And the good thing about a t-value is that it has meaning, right? A t-value of 1.96, conventionally that corresponds to um, point, like a 95% confidence interval, right? So if we map, um, things, if we map t-values after the Beirut explosion, we can see radiating damage outwards. Um, if we join that to the building footprints that are freely available in Earth Engine, we can get building footprint level estimates. If we look at Ukraine, we can compare um, in specific neighborhoods the damage to um, different buildings and compare them, the, the predicted damage to a Unisat uh, data set of labeled buildings. We can then compare those building footprints to the Unisat labels and get true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. Um, we're doing really well on the true negatives side of things. Uh, the true positives is a little bit, uh, is pretty good as well. Um, I've got 30 seconds left. Um, it works better than uh, interferometry and it works a hell of a lot better than recently published work that uses just log ratio. Uh, we use this in The Economist to do every building in Ukraine at many time periods um, using a higher confidence threshold than the one I showed you. Uh, we've got maps for all of the, uh, every major city in Ukraine and we used it uh, in Turkey as well. And they even combined it with housing price data in Turkey to show that the impact of the earthquake recently um, was higher in uh, 
lower income neighborhoods than in other neighborhoods. If you're interested in more, there's a web page for it. Um, I'm Thank you so much. And with that, our seventh speaker is Yuval Gandhi, who is a former Googler and was one of the early employees of Google India and part of the team that launched Google Maps for India. He uh, uh, back then led the GIST team in India and was also the lead trainer for Google Earth Engine in India and trained over 1,000 researchers, scientists, scientists and engineers. In 2020, he left Google to work on his startup, Spatial Thoughts, to create a learning platform to bridge the skill gap in the geospatial industry. His online academy has trained participants from over 100 countries, and his learning materials on QGIS, Python, Earth Engine, and GDAL are used by more than 1 million people globally every year. That looking forward. Hello everyone, uh, I'm an educator. I spend all my time creating content, helping people learn modern geospatial technologies. I teach a lot of Earth Engine courses. Every time I teach a course, I hear questions about charts and visualization. And I found that there was no structured learning material that helped people learn how to create really good charts and explore all the possibilities. So earlier this year, I set out to build a new course. It's live now, so I will give you a preview of that. Earth Engine provides you with charting functions that use a Google product called Google Chart Tools. Uh, so when you run this Earth Engine functions, they send the data to Google Chart Tools, they create the charts, and you get these charts. These charts are interactive charts. You can view them, you can download them, you can also put them in your apps so people can interact with that. So let's see what are the possibilities of the charts that you can create in Earth Engine. Remember, everything I'm going to show you is done directly in Code Editor no post-processing, you can see the charts live after you run the code. Uh, you can take an image collection in Earth Engine and you get a time series chart. Uh, you get one time series for every band in your image. This is showing uh, historic uh, climate data called Terra Climate and showing two bands of maximum and minimum temperature and how they change over time. Uh, Google Chart Tools has the ability to fit a trend line to any series, so you can fit a linear or an exponential trend line and they are computed dynamically and show up in your chart. You can also plot time series of different locations. Uh, here's a chart using the GFS weather forecast data and showing you the temperature between two cities uh, and how they're going to change over time. Pie charts, really popular. A lot of people wanted pie charts and they were really hard to kind of find material on that. So here's showing how we can take some land cover data and in a region figure out what is the distribution of land cover. The Google chart tool provides you with a lot of options on how to style your pie chart, pop out a pie, or add labels, etc. Uh, you can also chart feature collection. This is a data set on power plants and it's showing the distribution of installed capacity by different fuel types in a, a chosen country. A pro tip is you can actually add a background to your chart. It gives a really nice professional look and this can be done in chart tools as well. You can, many times you want to plot two variables. Let's say you want to find correlation between NDVI and precipitation and you want to plot them on a single chart. But NDVI and precipitation have very different scales. NDVI is between minus one and plus one. Precipitation might be like zero to 300. How do you put them in the single chart? So Google Chart Tools and Earth Engine allows you to have a dual y-axis chart. Each variable gets its own y-axis, and now you can plot them, and you can see the correlation between them. Similarly, you can create a combo chart where you can plot uh, multiple types of uh, uh, charts in a single chart, so you have a, a linear line chart and a column chart in the same chart showing the monthly as well as cumulative precipitation at the same location. You can do a transect chart uh, where you can see the spatial variation of the intensity values. This one is showing nighttime lights data in Tokyo and how it varies across a cross section of the city. Uh, Google Earth Engine exposes a subset of what is possible with Google Chart Tools, so you can kind of create all of this with that, but if you learn the, the format that the Google Chart Tools expects, you can use the Earth Engine API to reformat your data, then you can leverage the full potential of the, the Google Chart Tools. You can create something like this. You can add annotations, add different colors to your bars. And again, this one is completely done in your code editor, like no extra stuff needed. You can create stacked bar charts and add annotations and 
uh, so on with that. Uh, you can also get creative. This is showing the global forest change data. Each pixel in the image is showing the forest loss happened at a different time of the year. You can create a chart where each bar quantifies that forest loss, but also is in the same color, so you can see that in your chart. Uh, uh, whisker plots or box plots, the top requested chart that people wanted to do. I finally figured out, published it. This is the NDVI time series uh, where you can not only show one value, but the distribution of the values uh, over time series. You can also get a variation of this where you can show the outliers on the map uh, and use that. You can also now use this to create charts like this where you can show the spectral signature, but instead of plotting just a single value, you can show the distribution of all the pixels on the spectral signature charts. Uh, everything is open source, all the code is available. Go and uh, find this, I have lots of other open source content. So go and use it and build uh, publication quality charts. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, our eighth and last speaker today is Tyler Erickson, who is the owner of 4 Geo. Tyler is a geospatial technologist focusing on addressing global sustainability issues. He draws from a diverse background on engineering, earth science, and information technology to identify technologies and practices for accelerating the transition from research discoveries to operational systems. He scales impact by building and empowering diverse and collaborative communities to leverage geospatial technologies. Tyler is also the former lead for, uh, for Google Earth Engine Developers Relations. Looking forward to you. All right, thank you. Uh, so this is different than my normal talks. There's going to be non-technical very much. And it's not even people on the planet, it's people and people that I'll be talking about today. So I'm going to talk about collaboration and basically what you can think about. Because most people do need to collaborate because things that we're trying to do are very complicated. Nobody understands how to do it all, and you got to bring people together in order to get things done. So my perspective is going to be from leading developer relations for a number of years, putting together conferences like this, trying to get people to work together. Um, so collaboration is the act of getting people to complete a task, working together, and it can involve all kinds of two different entities. It can be people and people, people and organizations, two organizations together, um, and it can take money in different forms. But I was collaborating with uh, Generative AI in order to come up with a slide. Um, but I like have very simple models. The collaboration that I'm talking about here is that you have a goal and you're trying to find somebody else that has that same goal. You try to find out if there's alignment and coming together, working together, you can produce something that is bigger than either of you together. That's successful collaboration. Sometimes there's a little bit of an overlap, but you're going in different directions. These are ones to be a little bit wary about, this type of collaborations. These are the ones you really do want to avoid. Uh, sometimes, though, you can have very little small collaborations that can be very effective. Like, for example, there's a little bit of overlap with me and somebody that I met, but I know somebody else that they might be good to work with. Put them together and let them work. So it can be a little bit investment in your point, but really have large impact overall. Okay, so to evaluate a uh, potential collaboration, it's important to know what, uh, what is important to you and what is important to that person that might be in the collaboration. So how do you evaluate that? What could be important? Well, one is financial. Most people do need to eat and need some <laughs> money around there. It might not be the primary driver, but you have to realize that it can be important to people. Um, it can also change very much throughout your uh, career or life, whether this part is important or not, and it depends on whether you have basically had a startup that just got funded or not. It might change very dramatically. But financial considerations are important. You have to realize what is important to the others. Uh, mission goals, a lot of people here are very mission uh, driven. So if you can find good alignment in terms of a uh, mission, that might lead to a good collaboration. Some people like to collaborate just to learn new things from other folks. So that might be the, the goal that they are, are searching uh, for. So it's good to know whether that's important. Some people just get bored with what they do day to day and they want to find something else. Uh, so that's sometimes a lot of the collaborations we had within Google with these 20% projects. They wanted to work on things like Geo for Good or Earth Engine uh, because their other job was not quite as exciting. Uh, you do w sometimes have to look out for uh, personality compatibility um, because you might have uh, all these other things aligning, but just make sure that you can actually work well with that person. They, they enjoy the same things that you do at least enough to work together. And you also have to realize that people's time horizons can be very different. 
Um, so short-term kind of goals versus long-term goals, make sure you're aligned with that as well. And finally, confidentiality requirements. Um, some people like to work out in the open. Some people like to protect their stuff because they're going to like, you know, start a startup or something like that. So you have to make sure that you're aligned in that as well. Um, and finally, risk tolerance. Some people are really conservative and they want everything to work and they <laughs> want to be very controlling and others are very experimental and that's okay too. All these things could be important and you just need to find out whether whoever you're going to collaborate with, you have enough intersections so it may work out together. All right, so, but risk is a big one, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. What are potential risks that we've heard about? One is that I don't want to collaborate because my ideas could be stolen. This uh, often I've heard from people in academia, um, but I think that a lot of collaboration can move faster, so you actually can take advantage of, or can mitigate that risk because you have enough collaborations that you benefit from, so even if some ideas will be stolen, it's okay. Uh, loss of time, sometimes you get involved in collaboration and it just doesn't go the way they want, so you have to be wary of that. Um, and also be able to say that, hey, it's not uh, what I want to do. Uh, whether they have agency within their organization, uh, that's actually a risk too. Sometimes they might not be able to do it even if they want to collaborate with you. Some people are just awkward. Just let them, <laughs> it's a risk and sometimes it doesn't work out, <laughs> but that's just normal. Uh, collaboration can move a lot slower in the short term, uh, but it might be faster in the long term. And then finally, reputation. Um, in order to figure out whether you're compatible with with people, there's this idea of evaluation of trust and how do you learn to trust somebody. And so I just want to point you at this website, ncase.me.trust. It's a game, but it teaches you about game theory and how to trust people and things to consider. And I really love that thing. So I got to talk too much about that. How do you find these collaborators? Well, do you come to conferences and you can go to the ones that have 20,000 people and try to find somebody, or you can go to one that is smaller, like Geo for Good, and you can find a lot of people that you potentially are aligned with. I did an experiment with some others that we brought 60 people to uh, talk about geospatial stuff in the wilds of Colorado, climbing and mountain biking. That was just last month. This is very successful. Sat camp will go on again next year. And then finally, you can listen to podcasts. I like to do a lot, early morning hours, riding my bike, listening to people, seeing if they're interesting, and then I might reach out to them. You can uh, go on social media, but that's kind of, it's got its own worries. Uh, <laughs> I also like uh, trying to fix bugs, just contrib contribute to open source projects because you might establish like a little connection that when you then meet them in a conference or something, it can take off from there. And then finally, just look for other groups that are already have a pattern of collaboration and m find like-minded people within there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. We now have uh, about seven minutes for Q&A. What we're going to do is that Brian has the mic for questions, and I will go to the speakers. Also, a big thank you again for the speakers. Yes. For keeping in five minutes. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Maybe the worst job, having to interrupt people. So. All right. <laughs> There's a question there. Uh, yeah, thank you for the great presentation. I, this is a question for, for you uh, and maybe other of the, of the talks, and that's something that was mentioned in earlier session today. I was wondering if you consider, and I'm sure you do, and, but how you consider the ethic of sharing data about personal properties that has been damaged and, and, uh, and the people who are behind these houses and behind these properties that have been damaged. Is it something that um, yeah, you are thinking about and, and how do you approach that touchy, potentially touchy subject? Yeah, it's difficult. Uh, and this is a, a question across all humanitarian spaces where it's like, how do you balance? Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, the question was around uh, sort of navigating the ethics of uh, working with data on the destruction of people's property. Um, and yeah, I mean, in general, you have to balance like uh, how much do we weight uh, maintaining people's privacy uh, versus, um, you know, trying to do things that may help in reconstruction and, and uh, help people materially. Um, I mean, I guess on a certain level, all of the address, all of the data that we're working for is uh, anonymous, right? It's just uh, geospatial data. Um, we have building footprints, but those footprints aren't, can't be linked to any particular individual. Um, address data would be much more sensitive, obviously, to link to this type of thing. Um, what we're doing is effectively just looking at um, 
when and where destruction occurs and um, that information is being used for, uh, so it's currently being um, used by Ukrainian organizations to target relief efforts. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's a touchy subject, but the project doesn't involve any personal data. Um, and it, yeah, I think the, the benefits that we envision for this are, are trying to be able to direct resources for reconstruction. Um, so as we're weighing uh, privacy versus um, material impact, I think we sort of lean towards material impact. Thanks. Is there another question? Or anybody in the other room that we can't see, if you want to just knock on the door. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I had a quick question. Um, I want to talk about um, the indigenous tools. Um, one thing I was just wondering is that like software is very expensive to maintain. Often you need like maybe a full-time software engineer to um, be able to like maintain the product over time. I was wondering like how do you deal with like the the maintenance of those software tools? Um, how you potentially get funding or how you um, generally maybe do you, do you rely on volunteers? Um, yeah, just what, what do you end up how do you end up dealing with the logistics of maintaining software, especially? In, All right, thanks. Um, do we have a volunteer to answer this? Thanks. Okay, so your question is about when we have tools for indigenous communities, it's very expensive to develop and maintain software. How do we fund that? Um, so the Arctic Eider Society is a Canadian registered charity and most of our funding is from grants and like funding applications that we apply to and, and are given money for. And so that's how we're able to provide the app for free for anybody who is interested in using it, who agrees to the terms and conditions around um, Indigenous data sovereignty and um, privacy. So that is essentially the, the structure that we're working on. I think there's been some private donations in the past, but mainly it's government and nonprofit grants that we apply for. And it's really important to have an organization like ours, I think, uh, maintaining software because it is really impossible for a lot of organizations to put in that effort and every time there's an app update to update your tools. So that's something that we try and provide as a service. Yeah, so we have a team of people. I'll just ask again. Um, so do you have full-time engineers working on the, in the organization or do you have volunteers? Like how do you manage yeah. the actual... We're a small team, but we have a number of developers that work with us and for us. And uh, so we have a team that is consistent and, and they do a great job. Yeah, so one way that we're able to um, kind of do that, so you might have no noticed like in some of the presentations we have pictures of the scientists or engineers or other outsiders coming in to work with the community, but you're only there for a, a few months or maybe a few years and then you're gone. One way that this is kind of different in my case is that when you when you develop those people in those pictures from the communities as part of the tool development, you get a kind of a different take on it. And so as being like I presented on work being done in my home community, and so you can tell that I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to always live there. I'm always going to be in that community. So you start thinking about building that concept of empowering the community if this earth observation or these tools are relevant how are you going to find ways to pay for this tool and so that's really the the goal and the insight that we have now of course we've had some hiccups along the way i work for, with a federal agency and so uh, you're in the you're in the business of developing but not in the in the business of onm and so if you if you, we've learned that if you take that opportunity to empower the communities, to work with the communities, to get the buy-in to where they see the relevance of it, you're going to get the, that shift of change of, 
of, especially in the area of indigenous communities, to where they'll feel the, the necessity to, to fund these types of tools, to, to become one of the, um, those who are going to uh, participate in the ONM, and I feel like that could be one way to kind of shift that change of where you're not looking for outside support, but that support is coming from the inside out, and that, that's one thing that we've um, started to change. And um, uh, but right now, like um, I really enjoyed Tyler's presentation because that collaborating point really comes into play too, while you're kind of shifting these changes that do take time to kind of develop a different narrative when um, doing these types of tool development in communities. Thank you. We are running out of time, so I would encourage everyone, if you have more questions, to approach the uh, individual speakers now in the 15 minutes break or in the networking session that uh, we have at 4.15 um, right after the break. Before we thank the, the speakers, I just want to say I'm very, very impressed uh, by everyone's work. It's really, yeah, it touches me what you guys are doing. Keep on doing great work. Thank you all.